When the Prophet brought the teaching of Islam, he brought a teaching of equality where the rich and poor were now equal. Men and women had an equal status in society. He was telling the world two things. One was how to treat daughters with respect and how to respect women in general. And also the fact that in times to come, he will be indebted to Fatima and her progeny for the propagation and survival of his divine message. The message of love, of equality, of justice, of peace, not a message of what Islam has now is interpreted to be. At a very young age, she accomplished so much. In 18 years of life, we find that she leaves a legacy like none other. She is one woman who is the axis between both Imamat and, and Nabuat. To have someone like Fatima Zara is a treasure. It's really something that, instead of having it only in books and words, and you should be like this, and you should aspire to be so, when you actually see a person becoming like that, it really encourages you and tells you that this is possible. It's possible to be generous like Father. It's possible to be wise like Father. It's possible to be firm in faith like Father. O oh people, know that I am Fatima. And my father is Muhammad. I will say that repeatedly and continuously. I do not say what I am saying mistakenly, nor do I do what I do aimlessly. A messenger has come to you from among yourselves. So if you know him, and you know who he is, you will see that he is my father, not the father of any of your women. The Prophet's death signaled that there was a new era now where people had a choice to make. Either they follow what was planned for by the Prophet to the line of succession, having a firm faith after the Prophet, ignoring the worldly desires and acting as if the Prophet was still alive, being, a, being fearful of committing sins, being aware of lying, being aware of doing anything that the Prophet would not approve of, or to behave as all the previous nations had behaved. Once their Prophets were dead or absent, or whenever they disagreed and wanted to follow their worldly desires. And unfortunately, some of those Muslims found it easier to go back to their Jahiliya ways, rather than following the path that the Prophet had laid, and though he had done his best to warn them. Before the Prophet had even been buried, certain companions got together to decide what now was going to happen. A group of the Ansar had gathered in a, a meeting place, the Saqifa, which means the covered hall or the roofed hall of Beni Sa'd, who were one of the tribes uh, at the time. They owned this place where they used to meet. It wasn't a very pleasant place. And they began to consider who is going to be the person who is going to replace Rasulullah. Although at Ghadir, Imam Ali's choice had been very, very apparent. We find that there is a gathering that is taking place in Thakifa, and we find that the Ummah now splits into three. We have the 
we have the Alawids, who were Imam Ali salam, and his closest companions. So we know that Salman was with him, um, Ammar ibn Yasir was with him, Abu Dhar was with him, and many more. So we have those that were with Amir al-Mu'mineen and believed in his commandership. You then had the Mahajirun. These were the Muslims who converted in Mecca, and they were the ones who migrated from Mecca to Medina during the Hijra. You also had the Ansar who had converted to Islam in Medina, and when the Muhajirun from Mecca came to Medina, they were the ones that the Prophet paired them together, and the Ansar were the ones who gave, shared their wealth with the Muhajirun, gave them property, gave them the money to support the Muhajirun in their migration. I find that these two parties, both the people of Medina and the, and the Muhajirs, are arguing over who will be the, the Khalifa. Because the Ansar were aware of the fact that the Muhajir, Muhajirun are not going to uh, adhere to Rasulullah's command because they were already in a state of uh, disobeying him for not following, by not following, joining the expedition of Osama. And the, the event of pen and paper uh, was so of, uh, were well known that they realized that they were not going to listen to him. So the case of Imam Ali being accepted by the Muhajirun was obvious. The Ansar decided to uh, consult themselves on this matter. The argument was that Sa'ad ibn Abad al-Khazraji was proposing himself as leader after the Prophet. Now, the historians have discussed in length exactly what went on, what occurred, uh, and some have tried to explain Sa'ad's mo you know, uh, motives and Sa'ad's actions, but we know from this it triggered a word to some of the companions of the Prophet, namely the Khalifa al-Awwal and the second Khalifa. And they say to them that Sa'ad is planning who's going to be the next Khalifa, and he is saying that it is the Ansar's right because they were the ones that helped us. They were the ones that supported the Prophet. And they rushed to this meeting and they said, how have you come to this agreement that one of you, and that is the chief of the Khazraj, will succeed the Prophet? No way will this be accepted. Yes, you are the Ansar, but we are the Muhajirin. We were the first people to become Muslims. We are from Quraysh. We are the chiefs of the Arabs. We are the closest ones to the Prophet. No way should you become successors of the Prophet. Nobody will accept it. And one of them got up, the first caliph got up and narrated a, a, a hadith which said that Quraysh, the leaders are only going to be from the Quraysh. But he did not recite the full of The full content was from the Quraysh and from my progeny. But he decided not to narrate about the progeny and therefore confined himself to that. And some of the people in that meeting were jealous of Sa'ad. They were from the Aus. They did not want one of the Khazrajis to be uh, the leader of the Muslims. And so they said, yes, we will agree to what the first and second Khalifa are saying. And in this uh, heated debate and argument where there was even blows, where it became violence, when Sa'ad was hit and struck on his face and some of the companions were left bleeding at that time. These were companions of the Prophet. And a quarrel broke out in an argument. In this commotion, immediately two or three people began giving the bay'ah, the allegiance to Abu Bakr, the first Khalifa. And that was the story of Saqifah that took place. That deeply saddened the daughter of the Prophet because she thought, that they would have been civilized enough by then, after 23 years is a long time to be educated and to take benefit of the Prophet of God. And so the word spread out at this meeting that the first Khalifa was given the bay'ah, was given the oath or the allegiance of successorship. And slowly, slowly, as the uh, Muslims were hearing from one another, some went and approached the first Khalifa to give bay'ah, some turned away and said, no, we will not, uh, not give bay'ah because it is for someone else, it is for Ali ibn Abi Talib. Some just watched and observed to see what happened, and some were forced to give the bay'ah. When the Muslims heard of Rasulullah's demise, we hear that they were, they rushed towards the mosques, and the traditions tell us they were like sheep without a shepherd on a rainy night. When they went towards the mosque, we find that the second Khalif was there, and he was there saying to the people that Rasulullah is not dead and Rasulullah will not die until his religion reigns over the other religions of the world and that he would kill anyone who stated that Rasulullah was in fact dead. And then what happened was that people began to introduce 
uh, deliberately the notion that Rasulullah hadn't died, that the Prophet hadn't died, that he had uh, he would come back to life or he had gone away as Musa alayhi salam had gone to to Rasina and he would come back later. The first Khalif was said to have been out of town at this point. When he comes to the mosque, he hears the second stating that Rasulullah was not in fact dead. And he says to him, Rasulullah has passed away. The only thing that is living that will not die and will remain ever living is Allah. And the rest of Medina was busy with this news. Some were rushing to the first Khalifa, some were trying to find uh, uh, a space or time away from him. Some people were disagreeing and watching what was happening. Someone went to join the Ansar to see what, what had happened, why the uh, plan had failed. And Amir al-Mu'mineen was carrying out the takfeen and the ghusl of the Prophet. Imam Ali is said to have washed the body of Rasulullah and he says that with your passing something has stopped that has never stopped with the passing of none other that is prophethood, revelation and the news of the heavens. When he shouts, shrouds Rasulullah and he prays upon him he says the calamity of your death is great both before you and after you. And so the narrations say that Fatima to Zahra became so upset that the Prophet at least had a right over the Muslims that on the day he dies, they attend and they give their condolences to them, the Ahl Bayt, they grieve over this great Prophet, the best of mankind. And she says, oh, what a sad and terrible day that on this day, the Prophet's companions, supporters, all his friends are not around him. They've left him for the worldly affairs. And so this is the day that we can see the Muslims have truly now, some of them turn their back on the Prophet. And it is a sad beginning of affairs. When Rasulullah passed away, the first thing the new government did was, at Saqifa, they issued instructions for the land of Falak to be usurped from Fatima Salamul Aliyah. Fadak was a piece of land near Hejaz, which was a two or three day travel away from Medina. When the Prophet fought the Jews in Khaybar, there was a fear of the Jews because of the power of the Muslims. So what they did to the Prophet is they said that, please do not fight us and we will give you half of our land as a peace between us. This half of the land was in the Prophet's, part of the Prophet's property. Because it was acquired by the Prophet, as it was gifted by these people, uh, that was not a part of the property that was dispose, disposable to the Ummah. Rasulullah used to use this land in order to, to feed the poor from amongst Bani Hashim until the verse of the Qur'an came down that says, and give your near kin their due. It is at this point that we hear that Rasulullah calls Sayyidah Fatima the Zahra and he says to her, this is for you and your descendants. And therefore, Sayyidah Fatima the Zahra became the owner of the lands of Fadak. And whatever proceeds, whatever income came from this land to be bought to Fatima herself, the house of Fatima, the al would take a small income from this, from this land of Fadak, for their daily maintenance, for their needs, very, very small amounts. And then they would distribute the wealth to the Muslims so that for the past three to four years, the Muslims had been benefiting, the poor Muslims had been benefiting from the income of Fedek. So its source of income was being spent on the Muslims. It wasn't for Amir al and Fatima. It was a gift to her. She could have used the wealth all on herself. But we know the generosity of the Ahl Bayt was so that they preferred to give to others than to keep for themselves. The Khilafat confiscated Fedek away from Sayyidah Fatima the Zahra. And the books tell us that they did so in order to weaken Imam Ali and to weaken any opposition that would have been faced by them. When this was taken from her, they say that they took it on the stance that Rasulullah does not leave anything in inheritance. And when she came to know that the, her workers, her agents at Fadak had been dismissed, and they were actually beaten up and dismissed and land taken over. She prepared to confront the whole issue and meet uh, the new government's representatives. Sayyidah Fatima the Zahra was so deep in anguish over the confiscation, not only of Fadak, but of the, the rightful Khalifat from, from Imam Ali, 
that we find that she delivers sermons and she delivers these sermons in order to never in order to defend that which is right in order to enjoin good and to forbid evil and we find that his these sermons are used in order to prove that whatever justifications may be given by this illegitimate government she laid her claims and she laid that that was truthful on the table she walked it is said it is narrated in history that she walks like the prophet and as she's going she is very sorrowful and the mosque of the prophet the first and the second khalifa are there they put up, and the rest of the muhajirun they put up a curtain between her and the men and she gives out a moan and a cry and she cries and at this she starts narrating so when fatima is explaining here some of the characters of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it is also out of a sense of duty it's not for purpose of being eloquent eloquent or um, trying to show that she's more knowledgeable than others no the, she has a religious obligation to fulfill she needs to explain to these people who have now lost their prophet though they have amir muni but they have lost the holy prophet exactly what islam is about because the the role of the successors of the prophets is to keep people on the right path and to keep them on their initial understanding of islam and build upon it praise, praise be to allah for what he has granted us and thanks be to him i bear witness that there is no god but allah who is one without a partner he can never be seen with the eyes or described by the tongue he brought everything into being without anything existing before but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was able to make something, not from nothing, Fatima Zahra was very capable of what she said, not from nothing, but he was able to create something without relying on something that already existed. And this uh, is a very fine point. Uh, not everyone is able to grasp this concept of creation. If we were to think deeply about this, how is it that Allah originated things? How is it that he made us? What was the first step? But Fatima is able to, in just a few words, make a very, very, uh, rich and deep understanding of Tawheed for us, very clearly. I bear witness that my father Muhammad is his servant and messenger. Allah sent him as a prophet to perfect his command, to establish his rule and to implement the decrees. And so the prophet found the peoples divided into sects. And so Allah brought light to their darkness through my father Muhammad. May the peace and blessings of Allah be Allah then called him back to himself with love and mercy, and wishing him to return. And so the Prophet, she, Fatima Zahra Zuzmani, was sent as a guide for the people, so that there would be no excuse anymore. People cannot say we misunderstood the previous religions. The Holy Prophet is sent to perfect religion for you, to explain to you exactly what the best religion and best practice is. And this is significant because Fatima is leading into a sensitive topic about the succession to the Prophet. So she's saying the Prophet has come with very, very clear orders and a very, very clear vision. You are the slaves of Allah. You are at His command and prohibition. You are the bearers of His religion and revelation. He has established a covenant with you and left an heir among you. The speaking book of Allah, the truthful Quran, the shining and radiant light. So two things have been left for you. This book of Allah and us who are the speaking Qur'an. The, the Qur'an that talks to you, the Qur'an that informs you, us the al -Bain. And these two, when you combine them, when you use both of them, you get true Islam. So Allah has made faith a means of purification from associating parts. He has made prayers a means of keeping charity, a way of purifying the soul, fasting a way of instilling hajj, a way of building the religion, justice, a way to bring harmony between people, obeying us, Ahlul Bayt, a way of managing the nation, our leadership, the imama of Ahlul Bayt, a means of security from disunity, jihad, to strengthen Islam, patience, an aid to attaining divine, enjoining what is good, a means of bringing about, kindness to parents, a safeguard from wrath, maintaining family ties, a way of extending your lifespan and multiple sauce, a way of sparing, fulfilling vows, a way of attaining his forgiveness, giving people their full due in weights and measures, forbidding wine, a way of keeping the people above shameful, avoiding slander, a veil from being abandoning theft, a means of attaining integrity, and Allah has prohibited polytheism so that people may worship him sincerely. Fear Allah as he should be feared. 
Then she uh, explains the secrets of worship. So after beginning with some of the beliefs, now she's getting into some of the practices. And she's used this khutbah again as part of her religious obligation to explain to people Islam. O oh people, know no, that I am Fatima, and my father is Muhammad. I will say that repeatedly and continuously. I do not say what I am saying mistakenly, nor do I do what I do. You will see that he is my father, not the father of any of your women. And he is the brother of my cousin, not the brother of any of your women. And what an excellent assistant he was. He spread the message, came out openly with the warning, and declined away from the path of the polytheists. She says, oh people, know that I am Fatima. Understand me. Learn more about my life. Know that I am standing here and giving you a speech. You should understand my position. And I think that, that that's quite powerful. That Fatima was able to say those in a few words uh, and, and suddenly get people to think, okay, so she's going to say something really important here. Fatima Zara has uh, words for us that maybe for, for generations to come will have meanings. Before Islam, you were on the edge of a pit of fire. You were like a drink of water that a thirsty person goes after, the opportunity that an opportunist chases, the firebrand of someone passing by in haste, something for feet to step on. And yet Allah the Exalted rescued you through my father Muhammad, after much ado, after he was confronted by towering men, the Arab beast. But don't forget, now you're in a position, some of you in a position of authority, some of you now have soldiers, some of you now lead a government or whatever. Don't forget what you were like before the Prophet. So don't take it for granted that you are Muslims, that Islam uh, came to you so easily. It wasn't always like that. Ali strove hard for the sake of Allah. He is near to the Messenger of Allah, foremost among Allah's worshippers, setting to work briskly, sincere in his advice, earnest. While you were calm and happy, feeling safe in your comfortable lives, and you expected us to meet with disaster and waited for the news of our defeat, you retreated during every battle and fled during fighting. If you shy away from me, Munin, you've lost somebody who made you a Muslim. Were it not for Ali, who supported the Prophet, who defended the Prophet, who fought for you, who was there always, the last person uh, to save you from defeat. The person who never thinks anything other than how can I serve Allah and the Holy Prophet today? Who is loved by Allah and the Holy Prophet? Who is very close to Allah and the Holy Prophet? Amir al-Mu'mineen, Allah this person that you have, this treasure that you have, and now you're in a position where you might be supporting people other than him. This is a loss to you. Away with you, what you have done. What a falsehood. The Book of Allah is still among you. Its matters are clear, its rules obvious, its signs dazzle the eye, its restrictions are apparent, and its commands are evident. Yet you have thrown it behind you. Do you want to be rid of it? Or do you wish to rule by something else? Evil indeed for the wrongdoers would be this exchange. You made moves against the Prophet's family as if you were stalking them in swamps and forests. But we will be patient over you. Although it is like we are being stabbed with knives and pierced with spears. And now you claim that we do not leave inheritance? At this point in the speech, Fatima Tazara Samurai comes to the most important part where she is telling them what exactly is occurring. That her right, her inheritance is being taken away. She's being oppressed. The oppressors are doing uh, injustice to her openly, that nobody is willing to stand up and fight for her right, and that the results and the consequences of this uh, oppression will be on the hands of everybody that everybody will be responsible for whatever happens from now on. O oh Muslims, will my inheritance be usurped? O oh son of Abi Qahafa, does the Book of Allah say that you inherit from your father, but I do not inherit from mine? You have come up with something that has no precedent, 
Are you intentionally abandoning the book of Allah and casting it behind you? Have you not read where Allah says, وَوَرِثَ سُلَيْمَانُ Dawood and Sulaiman inherited from David? Or when it tells the story of Zachariah and says, and grant me someone from yourself, someone to inherit after me and to inherit after the descendants of Yaqub. Or when it says that blood relatives have prior rights upon each other in the book of Allah. So here the, the challenge is to the first Khalifa as well and also to the Muslims openly. And Fatima uses evidence from the Holy Quran and she makes logical arguments. Why is it that everybody can inherit each other but me and my father? Well, why not? What's, what's the reasoning for that? If the Quran is saying so, if common practice is like that, then why are we excluded? So the crux of the issue of Fedek is presented here. Uh, the, the, the real essence of the argument is presented in this particular part of the speech. You claim that I have no share and that I do not inherit from my father. Has Allah given you a special verse in which he has excluded my father? Or do you say these two, Fatima and her father, belong to different faiths and do not inherit from each other? Are my father and I not adherents to the same faith? Or do you know more about the specific and general meanings of the Qur'an than my father and my cousin Ali? So, here you are. Take it, like a camel ready with its halter and its saddle. But if we encounter you on the day on which everyone will be gathered, what an excellent judge Allah is. When the hour comes, the wrongdoers will lose out. And it will be of no benefit for you to regret your actions then. So here is the Qur'an between us, and you be the judge. Is it supporting me or is it supporting you? With all these verses that I'm presenting, whose argument is it supporting? She's, she's making a challenge to, of course, the first Khalifa, but also all the Muslims. And she's saying to them, look, at this point in time, we are on the, the point where we might become non-believers again. If we start to ignore the Qur'an, we're going to leave behind a lot, a lot of what Islam uh, as taught. O people who think, O strong supporters of the nation, O those who embraced Islam, why this shortcoming in defending it? Why this slumber while you see injustice? Did not my father, the messenger of Allah, used to say, a man is upheld by his children? How quickly you have violated his command. How soon you have plotted against us. Yet, you can still help me. Or do you say, Muhammad has perished? Surely this is a great calamity. It is tremendously damaging and will cause grievous injury. So is it a personal issue that because uh, Muhammad is preaching, we'll believe in him. As soon as he's gone, we're not going to believe in him anymore. Is this a personal thing or are you going to really stick to the message? And then she says, I am being oppressed openly. This is not being done quietly. This is being done in full light. Everybody can see what is happening. And you need to come up and, 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 uh, and defend me. Will I be usurped, the inheritance of my father, while you hear and see me? So while I'm standing here before you, my rights are being taken, can, taken away. My inheritance is being taken away. You can see this. And I'm speaking about it. And you're going to ignore it? Oh, you who think. Will my inheritance from my father be taken away while you are seeing and hearing it happen? You are numerous and well equipped. You have means and power, weapons and shields. Yet the call reaches you, but you do not answer. The cry comes to you. You obeyed us. So Islam became triumphant. The accomplishments of those days were realized. The fort of polytheism fell. The fires of disbelief were quelled. And the system. So why are you confused? Now, after everything was clear. Why are you hiding things after announcing them? Why are you turning back after going forward? Will you not fight those who betrayed their oaths? Who plotted to expel the messenger and were the aggressors? Who were the first to attack you? Are you afraid of them? Nay, you should fear Allah instead, if you truly be believers. So in no uncertain terms, we cannot now say, after 1400 years later, that part of history, uh, we shouldn't be so interested in it because there was a lot of confusion. There's no confusion at all. It's very, very clear. Fatima is making it very, very clear. That's right and that's wrong. 
If you want to be with the right, you need to stand up to the wrong. Very, very simple. And she's saying it in a term, in words. That, um, the Arabic is very is, is eloquent, but also very clear. Not ambiguous at all. It's unequivocal. She's saying you need to stand up and fight the people who are leading you towards disbelief. The same people who are ignoring the Book of Allah, the same people who are taking away my inheritance. They're the same people. After this warning, Fatima Nazara has told people what they need to do, but here now she starts to tell them what they're going to do actually. It's as if she's uh, trying to take away all excuses, but she already knows what's going to happen. Nevertheless, I see you are inclined towards easy living. You have pushed away the one who is more worthy of holding power. Surely I have said all that I have said with full knowledge that you will forsake me knowing the betrayal that lies so here it is take it take the leadership and put it on the back of an ill she camel with a meager heart and take it with everlasting disgrace it is marked with the wrath of allah and eternal dishonor which will for allah sees what you do and soon the unjust will know the end of what they have done and i am the daughter of a warner a prophet who came to you to warn you of the severe chastisement so act and we will act. Wait, and we will wait. I cannot force you into an action. Every person must decide by himself. But know the consequences of your action or inaction. And in this case, there is severe punishment and Allah is watching over you. And at this point, Fatima Salaam has completed her arguments. She has said everything that she needs to say and uh, it has become very apparent and very clear what people must do. And she is now waiting for some sort of response. And unfortunately, we see that the response isn't the one that she hopes for.